So you need to understand, in order to present a tree invent, it's kind of a very high level, the criteria to present here. You need to kind of a, you know, speak fluently, be a good speaker, you need to be handsome, and you need to be smart. That's why you have three speakers today, right? I will be the first one that will fluff the things up. We will try to do a little bit fluency here and explain what we are going to do for the last 45 minutes. Arjun will be, I guess, the smart one. We'll give the content about the cloud operations that we did in the last couple of years together with uh, T-Mobile as one of our premier clients. And then at the end, Steve will come and actually tell you from the inside out. And be a, I would expect that on the way out, probably everybody will, everybody will convert over to the uncarrier because you will be so impressed with what T-Mobile is doing, not just in a cloud space, but overall. So this is the last warning while some people are pouring in. Let me tell you what we are going to talk about so you can decide that maybe there is another session that you want to go to. There is a core problem that we have in IT industry as we are moving to the cloud. And this is what we, three of us, we are trying to address. The problem is that as we are scaling our assets, either in linear or exponential uh, rate, we're getting more and more compute and storage and network. The problem is that we cannot afford to scale operations in the same linear manner. So if the traditional matrix was to have, let's say, one operator per 100 or 500 or 1,000 servers, Whenever, whatever matrix you put there, and then you scale up your assets, it's unsustainable to have a linear scale of your cloud operations team. That's the first part that we are going to address. How do you avoid that? And the second one is that now in the cloud, not all tenants are the same. Your IT is no more homogeneous. If you read Gartner reports, or if you're looking into all of the other approaches, we are now talking about the multi-speed or bimodal and all of that. How do we treat different tenants that want cloud operations at the different rate. Some of them are telling the operations to go away and we'll do everything on our own. Others want the full white glove treatment and of course there's a full spectrum in between. So these are the two problems that we are going to tackle. If that's not your topic, please, as long as you feel the evaluation the correct way, which is that this was absolutely awesome, excellent session. Feel free, or nobody will be offended. Feel free and find something else to do. So let's jump straight into this. And by the way, feel free, if you really have a question to ask, we might answer short questions in the middle. But there will be definitely at least 15 minutes time for questions at the end of the session. Um, why us, right? Who are we? Who is Accenture um, unless? Um, you never heard of us. We are relatively uh, well proficient in a cloud. Kind of a, Accenture is working in a cloud computing ever since it really started to dawn around. First, we did that on our own. We, we are running mostly on a cloud internally. But majority of our portfolios, we also help clients to plan, strategize, design, develop, deploy, and then operate things on the cloud probably one of the largest cloud consultancy firms, for sure one of the most proficient ones, at least according to the IDC. Why am I giving all of this marketing pitch? Because we went through all of those pains. This is not something that we will give you a good theoretical pitch. We, mostly Arjun and myself, we are going to tell you what we tried, where we failed, and what are the things that we see that work. And I hope that some of our own uh, scars and maybe some of the stars we can kind of uh, rub off onto you. I lead cloud strategy program, which is mostly strategic planning and um, initial evaluation, part of the whole life cycle. Arjun is also in a planning, designing, and implementation arm. But as an Accenture, we actually offer the full spectrum from strategy all the way down to operations. Right. So the core problem statement here is that ITIL, which was designed many, many moons ago, and it was super high quality as an IT infrastructure management framework, is still great, but it was always made for humans. ITIL process groups were designed for human uh, 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 activities. They were not necessarily designed for automation. And that's why whenever we are looking into the ITIL and how does it apply and how does it scale in a cloud environments? We have those huge issues where how do we actually combine automation? How do we combine the things that now can be done? 
100,000 times faster with better controls, with more checkpoints, and kind of still try to stay within some type of a framework of ITIL. A typical example would be a separation between incident management and problem management. In a cloud, amount of incidents usually becomes so high that you prefer to move incident management, the low complexity incident management to total automation. If an instance is behaving weirdly, why would you even bother to try to heal it? You shoot it down, you replace it with a fresh new node and everybody's happy. You treat them like insects. You don't treat them like pets anymore in the incident management. Problem management on the other side wants to find out how to lower amount of incidents per time unit, which still today is a human-based action until, and I'll tell you more about that, until we get to the artificial intelligence and try to find out how are we actually going to tackle the problem management with automation as well. But in a nutshell, we do see huge amount of issues when you are scaling out in the cloud world. How do you actually use ITIL in a cloud? Planning the cloud is great. Buying the cloud is great. Migrating to the cloud is great. But then usually what we see is that they're going, oh, fine, you are now in a cloud, now you're on your own. That's where actually the real grind starts. And that's very much where Arjun and I, we are spending most of our time trying to figure out how can we actually help both from a cost optimization, how many people do you need, how do you actually grow assets versus keeping your operational teams flat and proficient. Thanks. <clears throat> Thanks, Mia. Good afternoon, everyone. So as Mia talked about, there, there's been a certain precedence that's been set with uh, the ITIL framework and how infrastructure has been traditionally managed. <clears throat> the way I would summarize it is that uh, infrastructure has been traditionally managed as a centrally protected asset uh, that teams use through a request response relationship. And then, so based on my experience of working with enterprise IT customers and uh, you know, really bringing public cloud platforms into the genetic makeup of how they run their workloads, that model doesn't scale. Um, it doesn't work. It becomes inflexible, it, it becomes rigid, uh, and it impacts uh, all the value propositions that public cloud provides. Cost, agility, scale. So what I've, there are four distinct uh, elements that, you know, uh, that basically change when, as IT is now becoming more of a cloud-enabled organization, operationally. One is this uh, notion of constitution versus control. So like what I said, we're moving from infrastructure as a centrally protected asset to more of a flexible enabling capability where you really need to give your tenants, and I use the word tenant as a consumer of cloud services, more flexibility than historically what has been provided, right? So that they can really innovate and experiment to full freedom within a certain constitution. And when I say constitution, like I've seen successful public cloud implementations um, had large enterprise customers who have had a sound, sound cloud constitution. Cloud constitution is a set of guidelines, principles, um, regu like internal regulations, and certain uh, guiding principles about how to use cloud within IT. Uh, the second thing is obviously this idea of self-service catalog. And, and you know, we look at the AWS marketplace and the AWS console, that's a self-service catalog in itself. But you wouldn't want uh, an IT organization of 10,000 people logging into that and provisioning services, because that might probably lead, will lead to a lot of things that you don't want, right? So how do you build an enterprise self-service catalog on top of that and potentially broker the relationship between the consumer of cloud and the actual cloud platform in itself? The third is obviously the notion of automated compliance. While cloud offers, and you know, there's many sessions around this, offers like the speed, agility, and scale to provision unending amounts of capacity, how do you keep all of that in compliance uh, in terms of uh, your, you know, your monthly obligations to patch, uh, your uh, periodic, um, you know, your quarterly uh, obligations to run audits and all of that in an automated fashion? So, um, and that's where like, we're seeing kind of concepts called baking, right? Baking is basically combining infrastructure changes and application changes into a common release process so that uh, com and compliance is one of those infrastructure changes that kind of gets baked in so that you're not intervening later on uh, into your infrastructure 
to, to get servers into compliance, to get services into compliance. And the fourth is the operating model, obviously, which we'll talk more about in the, in the, in the coming few slides. And what I say is like AWS really blurs the lines between compute, network, and storage, right? All of those are very seamless, easy to provision services. Uh, DevOps blurs the lines between dev and operations. So what does that exactly now mean for IT? Like what type of character must they move into to really deliver a meaningful service to the end customer? And I want you guys to look at this slide, you know, in a couple of different ways. Uh, but the, uh, Within enterprise IT, um, adoption of cloud can take various shapes and forms. It can really be rapid up in the beginning and then stall uh, because you reach an inflection point where you know, the, exci the excitement is over and now we must be pragmatic in terms of the economics as well. So what, what this, and then there's two different forces at play as well, right? So you've got multiple, like what I call tenants within an IT organization uh, each have a different unique workload, a use case that they want to leverage public cloud for. Um, and then you've got this, under, this universal understanding that the relationship between cloud resources and cloud services and the operations staff that's managing them is non-linear. So it should, must not scale with, as, as the number of cloud resources scale. So when you, when you consider that, you, you kind of come into an understanding of like how do you actually take public cloud deep within the enterprise. So this diagram kind of shows you the, the, the journey of a tenant. Uh, with, you know, each tenant has a unique maturity level, has a unique appetite for public cloud. Um, so that those journey paths must be understood within, and this is very unique within enterprise IT organizations. You know, it varies from org to org. Uh, we've implemented this as, at many orgs, uh, and it's been very successful. The other thing is like, what services, cloud services within IT need to be centrally managed versus managed by the tenant by themselves? Uh, and that is something that changes over time as well. So you can see the kind of the uh, tan yellowish boxes are kind of subsiding and decreasing as the journey uh, goes from onboarding to full scale implementation. Now there will, and not to sound prescriptive, but there will always be a set of cloud services that are centrally managed because you don't want your tenants managing them. An example of that might be the web app firewall. You probably don't want your tenants managing that, right? You, want, you may want to have a central networking, and I'm, when I say you, like I'm talking about a large enterprise IT organization which has uh, you know, uh, many distinct functions and roles. So understanding each tenant's journey uh, and then helping them through that journey to become self-sufficient, uh, to come to a state where they can self-serve themselves uh, and become less dependent on a centrally managed team is the key uh, to really get public cloud deep within the enterprise IT organization. Accenture, like as Mia was saying, has worked on thousands and thousands of cloud computing projects, all with, with hundreds of uh, enterprise clients around the world. And so this operating model is, uh, is, comes from all of that inspiration, all of that experience. And it, it's what I alluded to earlier, is like when you, when you see all these like traditional organizational and operational divisions and boundaries blurring, what is the target state that you're moving towards, right? And this is, this is one illustrative example that we've seen successfully be implemented in an organization. And it's sort of a ITIL-based inspired model, uh, but not quite. What the topic that we're talking about today, cloud operations, just sits in the center of it. And it's really a combination of, you know, assembly and operations working hand in hand together. The key takeaway is how do you provide a meaningful service to your end customer in the age of public cloud and DevOps. So there's a key revisiting that is required to your operating model. And when I say operating model, that's a combination of functions, teams, roles, skills, talent, processes, connections, and all of that to become a fluid enterprise. You may have heard of concepts like the two pizza teams or the two DevOps. Those are various implementations of this model. But each of the capabilities within, that are shown here within service assembly, service operations, and, and delivery must be considered when designing that operating model. And it's unique to each IT organization. So how do you get from, uh, how do you, Moving back to my graphical slide around the, the tenant journey, this is kind of a, you can read this slide top down. 
And what it, the message here is that enterprise IT might start off with a full, like a centrally managed cloud operations function which really is built not just to operate the cloud for many tenants, but to also educate them along the way so that they can become self-sufficient. And so you, you see that tenants in the beginning might require more white glove treatment than uh, compared to like over time as they get more mature. And as you move down with the progress of time, you get to an end state where you have kind of a Chinese menu of services, uh, which your tenants may or may not opt into. But there's always some constitutional principles and guidelines that they must adhere to, and those are important for the enterprise. So, you know, as an example, like we, we were at a client where um, there was, you know, there was a time when all these, all of these services were centrally provided, and eventually, like tenants became more and more mature where they took over some of the blue boxes that you see on top. Um, now that doesn't mean that you know, they started deploying new tools and it was a tools problem. There were certain constitutional guidelines that were provided uh, that they adhered to. And that's where we got into kind of a no ops model where you don't have dedicated centralized staff to manage operations for your tenants. With that being said. All right, keep on this slide for a while because the core, pro thanks Arjun. The core problem that we saw at our clients is, as Arjun said, we want to avoid that linear scaling. The easiest way to avoid linear scaling is to actually create a model that stimulates all of those tenants to become self-sufficient, to become self-served, to go through that whole idea of DevOps, but not the whole organization is ready for the DevOps. So we created a catalog of operational services. Think about it that when you are rolled into the cloud as a fabric, you will get all of those wide glove services, everything soup to nuts, like traditional IT always offered. But then there is kind of a catch. Every month you get either more pressure to start doing some of that stuff on your own, or we'll charge you more and more and more for all of those wide glove services. So it's almost like you give them a candy for free at the beginning from operational view, and then you either take the candy away and it's all kind of a free, or you start slowly charging for the candy. Different tenants react differently, but the whole model is that you want to create a stimulating environment that allows people to start thinking how they can offload certain amount of operational capabilities on, on their own. Now, I'm doing all of the theory. Let's look into this in a practice. Let me explain those pillars first and then we can go through the services. This is kind of an equivalent of a catalog that we create for our clients. And Steve will talk about specific catalog, what's offered within T-Mobile. But it's almost like a Chinese manual list. You pick and choose from this. More you choose, more you pay at the end of the month. It's almost like a tax on top of the raw cloud capacity that you buy out from AWS. Now, let's ignore the first pillar for a moment. The second pillar is where everything starts. What are all of the operational services that are non-touch, but gives you a great operational insight? Anything that is able to give you monitoring, detections, that gives you reports, that gives you kind of all of the matrices that operations can provide without ever touching your workload. And you all probably know that touching your workload is one of those most sensitive issues that most of the enterprises are freaking about. Looking at your workload is okay. Just look, no touch. And that's why all of those services in what we call measure and report pillar, they're usually relatively cheap. Very frequently, some of those services are actually mandated from corporate level, particularly security audit uh, monitors and stuff like that. Some of them are non-optional, but all of those in the second pillar will not ever modify anything of the tenant. The modifications happen in a third pillar, which is operate, right? We call that correct errors and issues. So some of the tenants will go, yeah, can you do patching for me? Can you do the full asset management? Can you do the spin up, spin down? Can you change if I am using instance to big into instance that is right-sized for me? And so on and so on. So the whole set of touchy operational controls that are in there. And of course, they, these are much more carefully chosen and selected because you touch now the operational environment of the tenant and you need to have a much stricter uh, um, control and much stricter contracts 
what does that touch mean? When is the window that you can do it and all of that stuff? And again, some of the things in here might be mandated. For example, doing the backup and potential whole business continuity planning services. In some organizations, we see that it's very much the risk mandated function that you have to get that operational service. In other organizations or for other type of, uh, of the workloads that are much less business critical, it might be an option. It might be completely skipped. We started to find out that when it comes to operational discipline, there is a decent amount of workloads that don't use backup and restore functions at all because they are not on that level of criticality. The fourth pillar is actually very interesting because what we started to see is that lots of organizations get into the cloud, they do that big oomph over the, the hump, and then they go, now we are super modern, we are super optimized, we are cruising, and they don't optimize it at all. You all use AWS, you all know how you can get the reports uh, directly out from AWS on optimization services. Are you well secured? Are you, load, uh, are, are you doing uh, cross AZ uh, balancing that kind of a, you get the proper uh, availability out from it? There is a whole bunch of continuous improvements that you can do on a cloud. And these are usually services that are kind of offered and they're invested from the corp level because in the longer term, they will optimize the bill. They will minimize the risk. All of the optimization, the improvement operational services are of the interest of the bigger corp. They're not of the interest of the tenant. But again, who is going to pay for that human effort or automation effort? It's entirely up to the discussion. But that would be the services in the pillar number four. And that's what brings me back to pillar number one. We kind of struggled for a while. How do you bring stuff into the cloud? Fine, we have all of the infrastructure set. We have all of the foundations built. We have all of the operational people that is ready to run that stuff. But if you use the old approach that you take that kind of a half-baked pig, you throw it over the wall to operation and go, it's yours, run it in a cloud now, usually it doesn't work really well because operations doesn't get enough of documentation, it doesn't get the correctly defined or designed or any of that. So it might look counterintuitive that we are bringing that integration services that are traditionally like an architectural or building services we are bringing some of those into the catalog for operations in order to help operations to actually accept the workload, that it is correctly provisioned, that AMIs are correctly baked, that you actually have the right blueprints to use. The best way to mandate the architectural guard, guardrails for your production is to actually put them into your operations catalog. It's not to kind of a hope that your architectural function which usually doesn't have any, any motivational tools unless you, know, you call, please, can you use the right architecture? That sometimes doesn't land. But if you give this function to operations, it's kind of a dramatically different. OK, so from that view, what changes when you measure success of operations? That's actually a key question. So we started to look into why, how will we know that that whole service catalog and DevOps enforcement and flexible, cat, uh, flexible approach to this, how will we know that we are getting better cloud operations out? What kind of, how do you separate bad versus good cloud operations, right? So the core business outcomes that we defined that uh, cloud operations teams should look into are improved quality, Reduced spend, which I'm sure that Steve will tell you a lot about because that actually he mastered the spend optimization on AWS. Definitely improved satisfaction of your own tenants. If tenants are going, I love cloud, but I hate to provision it through my own internal IT, I much more prefer to swipe the, the, the credit card and I'm getting the same AWS, that's obviously not a good cloud operations. And the last one, which is also improved employee experience, which Arjun with his little army of operational people knows how it works. People need to like their work and historically cloud operate, the historically operation functions, it's really hard to make them interesting and kind of a, a function that you really like. 
The rest of the tree, I hope it's kind of, a, I will not drain that whole slide, but operation quality comes out in those two big strategic drivers. One is that availability goes up, and the other one is that agility goes up. And then you can see all of the tactical approaches and everything that we are trying to fine tune and put the key performance indicators on top of that that actually help us to make cloud operations fit for purpose of specific organization. Right? Again, Arjun and I, we are giving here a little bit more generic view, but we address that client after client after client. Definitely with Steve at T-Mobile, we are by far ahead the way how we are approaching this. There are lots of things that we learned the hard way how you approach it. Now, where does all of that lead? Because we still use humans, and that is kind of a something that still we breached that first gap, and we are now optimizing how many carbon-based entities versus how many silicon-based entities we are, we are doing the ratios, but it is still that traditional approach. So we already are looking towards making that much more self-sustainable, intelligent, fully automated cloud operations, pooling best practices from different sides, and I will, let me quickly explain that from the bottom up, particularly on the left side. And it kind of will go through a couple of the principles. The concept, what operations in a cloud need to transform into, is first, we need to stop doing operational management on the instances that either run or don't run. Our, today, our typical operational control is very primitive. We see that something is not working and that's when very much we do the operational corrections. We need to go into the mode where we actually need to start to observe the health of the system way before the system gets really sick or you know, dead. So how do we start to look on the bottom level, which we call platforms and architecture, into all of the signals, all of the logs, all of the insights, and start to collect that obsessively, that actually your system because one, becomes one huge instrumentational engine that is creating crazy amount of information that might not make sense to humans. And you might not need to channel all of those logs and insights into any dashboard. Because what do you do with a dashboard? You have another Arjun's human staring at the dashboard and says, this shouldn't happen. Yeah, that's a wee bit too late. We need to have enough of the automation that is able to correlate the signals, that is able to say queues on a CPU are too high, or memory is too, too uh, or maybe uh, the amount of requests per second is coming too high. We are coming out from our full health for the given conditions. And then you need to get a whole bunch of the runbook automations that will ideally trigger themselves on their own. And you can go, well, if the CPU is too high and requests per minute are too big, the obvious runbook automation would be add a couple more units into your autoscaling group. This one is really trivial to solve. But once you go into more complex microservice integrations, runbooks become more complex. So you gather enough of the signals that whenever your health is not 100%, your automation needs to decide what need, they need to do to make it 100%. And through that, ideally, where we are looking into and experimenting right now with a couple of systems, that top tier that we are talking about is how do we create the zero downtime, downtime deployment? Not just blue-green deployments, which is kind of a flip-flopping on a DNS level, but the true ability that you can actually throw experiment into the production. And if experiment fails, the production will self-heal itself and go, oops, that was not the best thing. Let me go back to the either previous version or whatever the runbook automation decides. With this approach, our estimation at the moment is that very much you can keep your human operational team at, you know, single digit number. I would like to say that includes janitors and others, but we don't have janitors anymore because we don't have data centers <laughs> anymore. But 
if automation can cover 90 to 95% of all of your incidents, is able to actually eliminate the whole problem management space, is able to proactively look into all of the service group from security all the way down the, if, if you want to follow the service group of the ITIL process, that is that approach that dramatically stops, completely stops the problem of scaling humans in the, in the IT operations. How far are we from this? You can see bits and pieces. If you go to the Netflix, you will see, for example, for gathering the information, there is Atlas created, or you can look into the Splunk for the bottom tiers. We do have all of the basic ingredients. We are just now fine-tuning and playing together with clients and with Steve as well to find out how do we actually put this together with all of the greatest technologies that actually works right. And Steve, with that, I believe that I would like that you tell us all the glory about the Uncarrier. By the way, all three of us are actually coming from Seattle, right? Arjun, myself, you can hear that from my true Seattle accent, <laughs> <laughs> right? Oh, you hear? Perfect, go ahead. Can you hear me? Is this working? There we go. Uh, I want to reiterate what he was saying about an automated runbook, because um, this is one of those things, and tie it to the previous slide where he showed the various maturities of, of our self-serve clients. We have a team that runs a workload, several hundred servers, 24-7 operations with one person, and we have a systems operations center that does our 24-7 alerting that calls the teams, the operation team of one, okay? And they have one runbook one manual run book, everything else is automated. So this is all possible, it is work. It's a truckload of work, but you do have to get in front of it, like Miha was saying. You have to start thinking about it like you think about security, test-driven development, and operations before you go into an operational mode. That's really where you wanna be, and once you get there, the magic starts happening. Um, so I wanna talk a little bit about Uncarrier, give you a little history. Um, Myself, Steve Hall, I'm the Director of Cloud Strategy and Transformation at T-Mobile. Um, I've been there three, four years now. Um, four or five years ago, T-Mobile as a company was in trouble. It was in big trouble. We just failed to close a deal with AT&T. We were fourth among the large wireless carriers in the country. And we like to say we we're fourth, but the truth is there's only four of us. So we're effectively last. Okay, but nobody likes to say that at T-Mobile. We are last. J.D. Power, we are in the toilet. Our customer satisfaction ratings, horrible. So to pull out of that, part of the transformation group, we got together and said, hey, let's rebuild one of our customer-facing websites on AWS, and that's where the journey of partnering with AWS began, and then we brought in an Accenture uh, shortly thereafter. Um, but in that journey, to make a long story short, we are now the number three carrier there used to be like a 40 million customer chasm between the third place carrier and the second place carrier. We've got that down to about 15 million right now. So we're knocking on Verizon's door. Sprint, I'm not sure how far but they're behind us right now, but we're pushing. And part of it is what you see on this screen right here, which is the uncarrier moves. So we took a customer centric standpoint from a marketing point of view and said, we're gonna be the uncarrier. We're going to give back to our customers meaningful things to simplify the wireless industry, and we're going to move really fast. And guess what our chief marketing officer said? Went to the technology groups and operational groups and said, I hope you can keep up, because we're going to move, and we're going to move really fast. Um, he also went to the networking group and said, your network sucks. I know you hate hearing that, but you got to get better. So what we've done in just three short years is moved from fourth, knocking on second's door, we have the fastest 4G LTE network in the space, and we're giving back to our customers on about a quarterly basis with all these uncarrier moves. It is a great time to be at T-Mobile right now. It's exciting. AWS, our partnership with AWS helped us. Our partnership with Accenture helps us get there. So enough about that. Um, what I want to show you is, before I go to the next slide, is we have a typical, um, we're a North American company. We have a typical sine wave of, um, what normal operations is for us. We get our most volume between 1 and about 2.30 in the afternoon, Monday through Friday. It starts cycling down. Our low points are between 10 p.m. and about 4 or 5 a.m., where almost nothing's happening. 
Great model for auto scale group. The curves are nice. They're very predictable. You can start looking at, hey, here's Black Friday. We know that's going to double our, our workload. Um, the amplitude change is about 100% between our low points and our high points. That's normal. But once you get into uncarrier moves and you get into device launches, this is what happens to us. And this is my Charlie Brown picture of what happened on iPhone 7 launch. Within a minute, we had 500% more load than we had the previous minute. Okay, we knew it was coming. Okay, all the tools that Miha and Arjun talked about, these tools help us prepare for these moments, and we pre-warm to the point where an hour before, half hour before, whatever our ops teams are feeling comfortable with and our dev teams, we pre-warm. We get our world all set up, we get it going, it's sitting there, we actually pre-warmed this to about 400%, so there was about at 30 seconds, there was that oh crap moment where you better put some more servers in. We put more servers in, and we practice this stuff for days before. You bring up 1,000 servers, you shut down 1,000 servers, you bring up 100, you make sure it works, that automation has to work all the time, the same way every time at the click of a button or hitting enter on your command line. Either one, it's not, uh, we, we don't use humans, I can't get, a, I don't know how many humans it would take to launch a thousand servers in an hour, let's say. Really hard. But once we get to that top point, we can turn it right, over back, right back over to our auto scale groups and let them come down that curve nice and soft because we don't know when the buzz of iPhone 7 is going to go away, to be honest with you. And I love Apple. I'm an Apple fan. I have an iPhone. But I'm telling you, the way they launch these things where it's all the secrecy, the build up the demand and everything, and it's like midnight in a second you can buy your iPhone 7, especially that jet black one that they gave us 10 of, okay? <laughs> Thank you, Apple. That is a tough thing for us to deal with. So you have to look at this stuff up front to really get to where you wanna be, okay? So the variable workloads are really the thing that if you take nothing else out of here, understand your workloads, understand what auto scales can do for you, and then understand where your pain points are going to be. And then during these launches, we practice. We practice everything. I'm gonna, I'm gonna bring one more use case for you because um, I'm looking at the time and I have a lot of it right now. Um, who remembers Super Bowl 49? I'm a Seahawks fan, I remember it. That's right. You probably know who Malcolm Butler is now too, don't you? Very bad man. Um, <laughs> but uh, we actually did a Kim Kardashian fully immersive Twitter campaign during the Super Bowl. It was our first ever marketing campaign for the Super Bowl. Ten days before the Super Bowl, the marketing team came to my team and said, hey, we want to do this. It's new. It's unique. We, have, we think we have a lot of the technology partners, but we don't have any cloud expertise. How can we get this thing done? And I'm like, ten days. I'm screwed. Um, I said, sure, we're going to do it. Because we needed use cases to prove to the broader T-Mobile enterprise that, that AWS and will respond to what we can do. So once we did, first time we've ever done capacity planning at T-Mobile on AWS, we determined we needed 5,000 video servers. We needed 100 utility servers. We needed IOPS that kicked the snot out of what they could give us in the standard package. We needed more throughput on Twitter than Twitter could give us. And we said, sure, let's go build it, okay? Tom Erickson and his team came in. We brought in special events. They gave us all the IOPS we need. They made sure we had all the machines we need and everything. Seven days, we built out the entire solution. Three days, we practiced launching 5,100 servers for hour here, hour there, up, down, up, down. Make sure we can get it right. You repeat it. 4 a.m. Super Bowl Sunday, we launched the full stack. Good Morning America came on at 5 a.m., I think. Spike went up, took the spike, went later. John Ledger, he's very unpredictable. If you guys ever watch him in the media, he'll say anything and do anything. He started tweeting what the campaign was all about, and it's about Kim Kardashian about two hours earlier than we expected. We still managed to make the load. Then finally the campaign came out at the end of the, the first quarter, and everything went perfectly fine. Not a single technology glitch. That's where we all want to be. And I'll be honest with you, I'm really excited about the keynotes because Lambda, I hate infrastructure, folks. I don't like managing it. I want it to go away. I want Lambda, I want to put a whole web stack on Lambda someday 
and just run it without patching servers, without worrying about change management of servers, without any of this stuff. I just don't want it anymore. I don't know if you guys enjoy it. It's not my passion. I want to build something. I don't want to patch servers. I don't want to have arguments with ServiceNow teams that they don't understand the assets we have in the cloud because we use spot instances that come and go within 15, 20 minutes, right? So they keep saying, well, the report's out of sync. Well, no kidding. ServiceNow can't keep up with it because we just shut down 40 servers and we started 20 more, okay? It's different. The world is different. It's an ever-changing ecosystem. So I'll leave you with that thought, but it's, it's, this stuff is all possible and I know Accenture's here to help. Amazon's here to help. You know, look us up, T-Mobile team. We're all here to help. A lot of this stuff you learn the hard way and I would encourage you guys, make mistakes, keep trying, okay? but don't accept multiple mistakes in the same space. That's just, that's really bad. We make mistakes every single day on my team, and as long as they're not making like two, the same mistake two days in a row, I'm totally good with that. Um, so a lot of people wanna know what tools and controls do we use in place, who are our partners and that sort of thing. So I threw this eye candy slide together for you guys really quick, but you can see at the center of it, Amazon Web Service. They are without a doubt our preferred cloud provider. Um, we actually, in three years, we took 10% of our workloads or avoided putting 10% of our workloads into a data center, and we're doing it in the cloud. Um, you can see the outer ring blue is just kind of the, the genre of solutions that we have. Um, interesting thing happening at T-Mobile right now, even though we love all these vendors, Qualys is my favorite right now because they give you some really good metrics on what's happening in the cloud. Um, we're looking at going open source, a lot more open source not only using open source, but getting involved in the community. We have another problem at T-Mobile right now. We're just not that cool at the end of the day. The marketing campaign's cool, but when we try to attract talent, developers and ops people to come work for us, it's really hard to convince them to come to a telco. We're viewed as just an old enterprise telco, and it's, it could not be so far from the truth, but we figure we got another year or two of fighting that battle, so we're hoping open source, getting involved in the communities, gets us there. It's something you guys might want to consider. Um, so here's the money slide. This is what uh, Miha was alluding to. In the last year, we've been able to do this. We've doubled our assets on AWS, and we've cut our workforce by 43%. Total cost of ownership way down. Um, Miha also mentioned I am fanatical about the cost of the cloud. Uh, there are days when I think Tom Erickson doesn't like me very much. Um, <laughs> you know, we, we are looking for ever opportunity um, to get discounts. And what's interesting about the Amazon model is they give you a lot of options to save money. Um, take advantage of them. If you're doing anything with EMR or anything like that, we have been hugely successful with um, spot instances, large numbers of spot instances. We've been uh, reluctant to really jack up our reserved instances. At the end of the day, we run a pretty low number um, just because we haven't liked the lock-in, but with the new changes in RI, we're gonna push the limits a little higher there. These are cost savings, it's money on the table, it's free. Take it off the table, put it back in your pocket, invest in making your companies better. Um, that's what it's all about. But this is when the magic starts happen, happening, this is a cool thing. And this, like, this is what the leadership loves to see because we've been preaching agility, cost, and security in the cloud for three years. And this is like the first physical evidence that we've finally gotten to something we can really, really control from a total cost of ownership point of view. So I wanna leave a couple of thoughts with you guys. Um, there are decisions we've had and discussions we continue to have throughout the organization um, at T-Mobile. The first one is, are you bimodal or are you trying to do this in flight? We chose bimodal. We have a separate data center team and a separate cloud team under me. Um, you're in one or the other. You can use services from one or the other, that's fine, but you're operating and building in one or the other, and they're governed completely different. They have a different set of rules, um, different set of, I, I hate the word, some of my guys are in here, they're gonna shoot me right now. They have their standards, we have our choices, that's gonna tell you what my bias is, um, which is really what we're talking about on the next one. You gotta figure out, do you wanna have standards in your cloud, or do you wanna give your developers choices and freedom? We have chose to federate out our development and our operation teams as one team. They own the full stack, from infrastructure to operations to monitoring to customer satisfaction to everything, okay? In that model, 
we don't want to restrict them from coming up with new ideas that would make T-Mobile better. So if they don't like, <laughs> excuse me, if they don't like Splunk and they want to do an Elk stack, go for it. Okay, that's between you and your leadership and how much that may or may not cost. Okay, if you want to go to open source, do it. It's cheaper. You know, we we do use several. Um, you know, public versions of open source projects, and we're like, yeah, let's get that out there and let's just go to the free open source because all you're doing is paying for a support that we're not really using at the end of the day. And so these things are really, really good, good questions you guys want to answer for yourselves. Um, another one, do you want to control the cloud or do you want to enable your teams to do really well in the cloud? We enable, okay? We try to get the lightest weight governance model in place as possible so that they can move freely and get what they want done. The only thing I really want to control is runaway costs. So we have some pretty hard line controls about how much you will spend and where. But other than that, other than like a wide open security breach, we're, we're minimizing controls and letting the app teams learn and make their own mistakes and get better. Um, full service to self-service, like Miha said, and, and you saw from the maturity slide that Arjun threw up there, we have multiple levels of maturity. We have teams that are like, you want me to do what? You guys gotta go do that. That's what Miha calls a white glove, which we, my team just goes and operates it for them. Well, guess what? It costs a heck of a lot more if you just go learn it and you take one of the more mature teams where they're running hundreds of servers with one ops person. It's, it's, it's just, it's a choice. You gotta figure it out. And then are you automating everything? Can't say it enough. If you're not automating everything, even if you think you're automating everything, look again, you're not. I mean, we, we're constantly looking around and saying, hey, didn't that person do that last week? Yeah, they did. Why isn't it automated? If you can write a run book, if you can prescribe the steps for an ops person to do when something goes wrong, you can write code to solve that problem for you, fire it off with a Lambda function on an alert, and have it taken care of. You can do that. So with that, um, we're almost out of time. I'm going to bring the guys up here and Q&A. Perfect. Just to kind of wrap it up again from 10,000 feet, cloud changed everything in IT quite dramatically. If you're looking, if you have developers in your own house, what developers want is to throw their codey thing into their cloudy thing. And everything else shouldn't matter. If you have COTS solutions, and again, how do I throw my COTS thing into my cloudy thing? Everything else should be kind of as minimized and put into the background as possible. So it's not just that cloud is more than just yet another hosting environment. It shouldn't be treated as hosting. And that's why readdressing the org structures, readdressing the skill set. Uh, you saw the slide of minimizing the, by the way, Steve, you didn't say that was an operational people drop. You are still growing dev teams. Right, but the team for operations fair, fair is statement. dropping. Fair and, statement, and actually let me close that off too. And they didn't go away. They were all retrained into the dev side. Okay, so we, we're growing so fast, we, we're not letting anybody go. I mean, if we lose somebody, we lose somebody that's sad. But at the end of the day, everybody is retrained, cross-trained into roles as we get more and more efficient on the operational side. That is a really good cultural point because if you show that slide to folks and everybody has the reaction he just did, it's like, oh crap, we're gonna have to lay people off. No, you, you can't afford to do that, you really can't. Um, but it depends on your business and what the velocity of its growth is. Good when point. it comes to operations, uh, let me give you for, as a farewell before we go with a Q&A an analogy, which is a car plant. If you remember how car manufacturers used to work 20 years ago, where all of the blue collar workers were on the front line and they were welding and painting and polishing and you also had a human quality control at the end and then car after car rolled off the production line. If you're looking at a typical car plant today, there are no humans there. Actually, probably they would get hurt if they would be there because it's all automated by robots. Comes back to Steve's question, where are humans? Humans are making robots that make cars. And that's exactly what we are trying to do in operations in a cloud. People in a cloud are making automation that controls production. What's the ideal state? And very much you heard Steve saying, not with those words, but still, you don't want humans to ever touch production. If production doesn't work right, go and fix it in a design time. Don't fix it in a runtime. 
I mean, every study for the last 10 years shows you when you allow humans to meddle in the runtime environment with production, they usually cause more problems and outages than fixing them. So you, we need to change that whole operational model, soup to nuts, from the beginning to the end.